done for us and will do, Lord. We thank you that your God who reigns so high and that there's none like you, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray even right now that you would just open up the windows of heaven, let the power of the Holy Ghost flow into this place, let your anointing flow into this place, Lord, like never before, and just cover each one of us with it. I pray, Lord, that you anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth your work, and we give you all praise and glory with everything that's said and done. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Don't die on this mountain. When we look at the Word of God, there are several famous mountains throughout the Bible itself. Mount Ararat comes to mind with Noah's Ark. Mount Sinai comes to mind with their, as Abraham goes up to offer Isaac. And it is the future home of Jerusalem and the temple. But the mountain that we're going to look at tonight is that of Mount Olivet. Mount Olivet is one of the most important mountains in the Word of God. It is mentioned in only 15 verses of the entire Bible. Yet there is such significance that is tied to this mountain, we cannot forget about it or push it into the distance. It is the site and one of the most significant passages of the Word of God. In fact, we may call it the most significant passage of the Word of God because it is there where Jesus Christ sets his mind eye on and his heart to the fact that no matter what comes his way, he is going to go to Calvary. He is going to die for the sins of humanity. Mount Olivet contains so many so much significant when it comes to the life of Christ in general. It is the location and home of the longest discussion on end time events that we know of as the Olivet Discourse there in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. But as we look at Mount Olivet, it plays such a large role in the life of Jesus Christ. If we go back to the very beginning of time, we find that God is in the middle of creation. And he gets to day five. And he creates one, or day six, and he creates one of the most proud and jewel pieces of his creation. He creates man. But man, as perfect as he was at the beginning, Without flaw, without spot, without wrinkle. The very breath that came out of man's mouth in the very beginning was not air from this earth, but rather it was the breath of the Holy Ghost as Adam exhaled. But in the very beginning, sin began to creep in. And the Bible says that Adam sinned. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible states, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. We go back about the human argument about who brought sin into the world. Was it man or was it woman? Well, if it wouldn't have been for a woman, man would have never taken of the fruit in the first place. So the Bible says that Eve was deceived, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. And because Adam partook of the fruit, that perfect creation now became polluted. For the Bible states in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You realize that you and I were born into a sinful world, and because one man sinned, that sin nature was passed upon every single individual that came after him. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as we go back to Genesis, we find that there's a price for sin. It wasn't a matter of offering up fruits and vegetables as Cain tried and was displeased when he did things not the way that God told him to. But rather, there was a blood price that had to be paid for sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 states, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, the wages of sin is death, 
But God looked out upon humanity, humanity and showed from the beginning that there had to be a blood sacrifice. And Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, as God looked down through the portal of time, realized that it wasn't going to be the blood of bulls and goats that would do away with the sin that came into the world, but there was only one remedy for that sin, and it was the precious blood of Jesus Christ, because as God looked down through his infinite wisdom and silence, the king was born and Abel was born and Seth was born and Noah was born and Shem was born as as Enoch was born. And he went down through all time and saw all the way through to the as our pure, current time is and he saw that there would not be one single human being that would be born in this world that would be able to be the blood substitute to take the place of that sin to cover it and do away with it forever. And he said, you know what? I need to do something. I there man will not be able to do away with sin in his own doing. So I am going to have to step in. And as we come across that time of 5 BC, God sends down the remedy for sin and very own son, Jesus Christ. And as we look there, Jesus Christ came into this world for one reason and one reason alone. Whether he realized it there in his infancy stage or not, he was born with one goal in mind, one purpose in mind, and that was because he had to be the remedy of sin, Sister Susan, because if he would get to that point in time when he would be the perfect sacrifice, then it would be time to lay himself upon the altar as Isaac did. He would have to lay down his life, Sister Rachel, because if he does not, all of humanity would be doomed for all time, and sin would consume and take over, and death would pass on from one day to another. And because the perfect remedy chose not to die for the sins of humanity, we would all be living in a hopeless world. But we will look down, and Jesus Christ came down for one reason and one reason alone, and that was he had to die for the sins of mankind. He had to be the perfect blood and the perfect lamb to be the perfect substitute for our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 states, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness that that we may be, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For then we then must he often have suffered since the foundations of the world, but now once uh, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away the sin of the sacrifice of himself more than likely it was and when we look at this passage we see that Olivet played a very important role when it comes to the doing away with the sins of humanity if we would go back in time to the life of Jesus Christ we find that he had some friends over there in Bethany Mary Martha and Lazarus. And where is Bethany? On the east side of Olivet. If we would go through the Word of God and look at the life of Christ, He would send His disciples to go to a certain location to get a colt and a donkey before He would enter into Jerusalem. And where did He send them? He said, I have a friend over there in Bethany. Go over there and tell them that the Master has need of these things. Where was he more than likely sending them? To the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So as these disciples would travel from the west side of Olivet to the east side of Olivet to get the donkey and get the colt. And what was the purpose of these two animals? Jesus Christ was preparing to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What are we getting a picture of tonight? We are seeing the very first office of Jesus Christ being displayed as prophet. And he's about to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Not as the king of kings, 
and the Lord of Lords. But he was about to make his way to Jerusalem through his triumphal entry as the wage payer for the sins of this world. We find that it is from Olivet that Jesus Christ would more than likely ride this donkey and this colt into Jerusalem through the east gate. And while they cried with Paul Lee's waving, Hosanna, 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 they had no idea that yes, he truly was, had a reason to cry Hosanna, but it wasn't for the reason that they had in mind. They thought that Jesus was coming to deliver them from the oppression of the Roman government and take back the physical government. But that's not exactly what Jesus was doing. He was coming and showing him that he was making a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, not to establish the physical kingdom of the earth at this time, but he was showing that he was going to be triumphant over sin. He was going to be triumphant over the enemy. He's going to be triumphant over the devil. And that he was going to be the one to make the wages to go away forever if we would only accept him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If we would accept him as the Messiah, Jesus Christ was making the triumphal entry into Jerusalem as the wage pair. But they refused to accept him. Oh, if only we would look at Olivet and see what she has to tell us today. We would see that she would show Jesus Christ as the wage pair. But we would see that Mount Olivet would also show Jesus Christ as the weeper. For there we find in Matthew chapter 26 and 36, then that Jesus with them unto a place, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little bit farther and fell on his face, face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What well, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter in not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except a drink of it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he unto his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed unto the hands of the sinner. Hands of the sinners. If we would study it out, we would find that Jesus Christ went after they sang a hymn after the last Passover, after the last supper, and they went unto Gethsemane. Where is Gethsemane? Is in the mouth of Olivet. Jesus Christ left Olivet and he made his entrance into the city. We call it a triumphal entry. He proclaimed himself that he was come to be the wage pedder. But now we find himself going and returning to Mount Olivet after his tri triumphal entry. And he's weeping before the Father, saying, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from him. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to have to die for the sins of the world. And we find him weeping in Mount Olivet. Lord, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to endure the gnashing. I don't want to endure the weeping. I don't want to endure the whipping. I don't want to have to carry that heavy cross. Lord, it seems too great to bear. But if it be your will, I'm willing to go and do it. And the Bible says that right there on Mount Olivet that Jesus Christ makes up his mind. How do we know that? Because in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, the Bible states, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. You see, it was right there in the Mount of Olivet that Jesus Christ not only wept, Father, take this cup from me. If it be your will, I'm willing to do it. But take it from me. Please let it pass. But it is right there also. That in the midst of the tears, in the midst of the sweat, great sweating of the great drops of blood, that Jesus Christ said, you know what, Father? I will take this cup. I will drink of this cup. I will drink of this bitter cup for one reason and one reason alone. I'm going to do it for the church. I'm going to do it for the joy that is set before me. I will endure the agony. I will endure the pain. And it's right there in the middle of the weeping, in the middle of the bashing of his teeth, the weeping of the great sweat of drops of the blood, right there in all of it, that Jesus Christ made up in his mind that it didn't matter what the price was going to be for the cross, for the joy set before him, he was going to go on and endure whatever he had to, that man might be redeemed from the sins that Adam had brought into this world. It was here that his mind was made up. First John chapter 2, verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but also for the sins in the world. First John 4, verse 10. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He was to be the substitute for our sins. He was supposed to be the eternal covering for our sins. He was the scapegoat that went before. He did no wrong, but because of the wrong that we had committed, because of the wrong that had entered into the world through Adam's sin, he was the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Not only was he the wage pair, not only was he the weeper, but on Mount Olivet, He's also the warrior. You see, Jesus Christ left this earth not from Mount Sinai, not from Mount Ararat, not from Jerusalem, but he left from Mount Olivet. Acts chapter 1, 9 through 12. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye, stand, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. And get verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, from where? From the Mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, as we look at this passage, Mount Olivet has so much to reveal to us today if we would only open up our hearts and our minds. You see, it was from Mount Olivet that Jesus Christ revealed himself as the wage payer. That triumphal entry into Jerusalem was exactly that. He was showing that he was about to be triumphant over sin. He was about to be triumphant over the enemy. He was about to be triumphant over sin and disease through his death on the cross. We find that Mount Olivet reveals Jesus Christ as the weeper, as he is there in Gethsemane, battling. You would think your battles come in the valley, but Jesus Christ was on the mountain battling. As he cried out with great drops of blood, Father, let this cup pass from me. But I can only imagine after the great tears of anguish came great tears of joy. As the joy that was set before him, he became triumphant right there on the mountain, Sister Susan because of the joy that was set before him. And then finally we see Jesus Christ in his last office as king. All three offices represented here. 
prophet, priest, and king. As he's the warrior. As he left all of that, the Bible says, this same Jesus shall return in like mountain, in like manner. You realize that there's coming a day in the future when Jesus Christ's foot shall return once again. Not to know Sinai, not to Mount um, so, uh, Ararat, but to Mount Olivet. The very first place that Jesus Christ is physically going to set foot down on is in Mount Olivet. And it's going to be there where he forms the valley of Jehoshaphat. That the great war takes place. That the kings of the earth comes in and wages war against the king of kings and the Lord of Lord and the armies of the hosts of heaven shall follow behind him as that great word of God comes out as a sword out of his mouth. In that valley of Jehoshaphat that is going to be formed from the foot of Jesus Christ that he put in Mount Ararat. The blood's going to flow up to the horse's bridle for up to 200 miles. All of that has a lot to reveal to us tonight. The life of Christ continually brought him back to Mount Olivet. But let me tell you tonight that not all your battles that you fight are going to be in the valley. They're going to be on the mountainside as well. I'm here to tell you, as you're fighting the battle, as you're going up the mountain, don't let discouragement set in. Don't let depression set in. That's exactly what the devil wants. You think that Jesus Christ was alone in the Garden of Gethsemane? You think that the devil wasn't there trying to stop him? You think the devil wasn't there trying to prevent Jesus from making his mind to go to the cross? If Jesus had to battle on the mountain, we're going to have to battle on the mountain as well. But let us not let the trials of life get in our way. Let us not think that we are going to fall back to the base and fall back to the same valley. But we need to sink our feet into the ground right there and make a stand. The Bible says that our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are those shoes? Those are basically shoes with steady up, steel spice in them, so you get your footing. Don't let the devil kick you off far on the mount. Don't let him knock him back. But sink your feet firm into the word of God, say I shall not be moved, I will not give in to the discouragement, I will not give in to defeat. God has not brought you to this mountain to die there. Jesus Christ was not brought to Gethsemane to die there. Jesus Christ was not taken to Gethsemane to get a depression to see, see fit. But Jesus Christ was brought to Gethsemane to make it sure that his mind was made up that no matter what the cost was, no matter what the price was, he was going to go all the way to the end. I'm here to tell you tonight, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what the battles you're going through on the mountainside. But don't give in. Don't give up. For there's one that goes before you. We have time to see our feet into the dirt firmly and say, devil, not Why don't we find ourselves a place around the altar tonight? Don't 
God on the mountain. 